on this episode of the Wild Fed Podcast. Having an animal surrender itself to you is humbling. That elk offered his life to you and you didn't take it and now you have to apologize. The way humans live on the planet today, it's almost like they're astronauts from somewhere else. We're all native to Earth, but until you eat something from the Earth directly, it's hard to know that. Having the experience, you know, is one thing. Hearing about it's another. And uh, the actual experience, of course, is what changes your life. The things that happen blew my mind. It's counterintuitive to so many people today who think that if they kill, that's going to bring darkness into their hearts and not realizing that it actually can cleanse the darkness from your heart. Respect, respect, respect. I think that's powerful. When you start to pray in earnest, it responds so quickly. Why have I been trying to do things under my own strength for so long when there's such a more blessed way to live in the world? In the third dimension, everything functions on opposition. In the fifth dimension, there is no opposition. Episode number 67 of the Wild Fed Podcast, Hunting in the Fifth Dimension with Dr. Randall Eaton, is brought to you by Sir Thrival. The entire month of February is Sir Thrival's much-anticipated annual colostrum sale. Right now and for the rest of the month, all colostrum products are 20% off with the coupon code HEALTHY2021. Sir Thrival's powdered colostrum comes in several sizes, from 6.5 ounce to 1 kilo to the gigantic 2 kilo container that I call the Darth Vader helmet because it's a huge oversized black tub. That's the one I get each month and I use it just about every single day in my morning smoothie. Here's just a few of the reasons to start using colostrum. Colostrum is nature's first food for mammals. It contains all known mammalian growth factors. Those are like steroidal compounds, as well as essential fatty acids, essential glyconutrients, and all of the essential amino acids. It is a complete food. It's a supreme gut lining regenerator and an incredible supplement for any kind of digestive issues. With its rich immunoglobulin count, it helps build powerful immunity, with studies showing it to be three times more effective against flu than vaccines, even in high-risk patients. Sir Thrival's colostrum is delicious. It's the perfect smoothie ingredient and an excellent addition to your healthy eating plan. Find it and more at SirThrival.com and use the coupon code HEALTHY2021 for 20% off all colostrum products throughout the month of February. Wild Fed is also brought to you by the Farmer's Juice. Cleanse, nourish, and rebuild your body this winter with the incredible juices from the Farmer's Juice. Go over to thefarmersjuice.com and take a look at their juices. Each one contains a full pound of fresh organic produce with absolutely nothing artificial added, and they deliver direct to your door. They've got all the ingredients you're looking for, and their delicious juices stay fresh for up to 30 days. In addition to their complete line of juices, they've also got a variety of wellness shots and plenty of low-sugar and keto options, too. Check out their Mostly Greens box that contain 20 juices and 10 wellness shots. Their variety boxes, again, that's got 20 juices and 10 wellness shots, or their Wellness Shots box, which contains 30 of their wellness shots. Again, go to thefarmersjuice.com and use the coupon code WILDFED for up to 8 bucks off your order. Again, it's thefarmersjuice.com. I'm Daniel Vitalis, and you're listening to The Wild Fed Podcast, a show about reconnecting with nature through hunting, fishing, foraging, and food. Wild Fed. Food is all around you. I've got a really fun episode for you today. I've been trying to interview Dr. Randall Eaton for several years now, but somehow we just kept missing each other. As you probably know from listening to this show, though I hunt, fish, and forage for food, and in that way I'm pretty pragmatic about these practices, I'm also really drawn to the more reverent and spiritual side of hunting, and I've been exploring that here on this show in some recent episodes. I knew Dr. Eaton from a documentary he produced in the 1990s called The Sacred Hunt. That documentary is still available and free to watch on YouTube, and it looks at the indigenous or what Randall calls the endemic approach to hunting as opposed to the modern sporting approach, and it also explores the relationship that conscientious hunters have to the animals that they harvest. I also knew Dr. Eaton had written books on hunting as a rite of passage for boys and even worked with orca whales, the world's largest species of dolphin, eventually making a documentary called Orca, the Sacred Whale, as well as writing a book entitled The Orca Project, A Meeting of Nations. However, when I finally spoke to Randall, who's now in his late 70s, I was still quite surprised by the direction our conversation took. Now, just to be clear up front, I can hang with just about any conversation. In fact, I really enjoy having complex, deep, and even contradictory conversations. I appreciate a lot of different perspectives, and I don't need to agree with everything being said to have a good time. This is particularly true when the conversation turns to metaphysics, which I find fascinating, but also utterly subjective. 
What I mean is certain beliefs people hold about the nature of the universe or the existence of deity just can't be proven. Instead, they require faith and belief, and I'm okay with that. I just don't rigidly subscribe to anything too specific since I understand that these beliefs are purely subjective and if you follow them too long, you can end up pretty far out on a limb vehemently arguing over the existence of Bigfoot or aliens building the pyramids. At the same time, I also find that purely objective perspectives can become something of a mental prison being far too limiting to the human spirit since much of what we feel and experience can't be measured or explained just yet. So I guess that makes me sort of an existential agnostic. Anyway, I'm especially interested in how people in the autumnal years of their life perceive the world and what messages they find most important to impart to the following generation, particularly after a rich, long, and adventurous life. So this conversation with Dr. Randall Eaton contains several ideas that I don't necessarily endorse or agree with, but I also find fun to talk about. God, extraterrestrials, myths and legends about our ancient origins, and even psychic communication with other species. All fun stuff and all subjective personal beliefs. I can't confirm or deny the veracity of Dr. Eaton's ideas, and actually, I don't feel any need to. These are just his perspectives and they're fascinating, especially coming from someone who's worked so long in the academic space to promote hunting as a healthy expression of our humanity. So I don't think you need to agree or disagree with what he has to say here. Rather, just listen and draw your own conclusions. If nothing else, it makes for some lively conversation. And at best, it might subtly shift your perspectives about the nature of our world. Dr. Randall Eaton, welcome to the show. Thank you. Good to be here. Yeah, I'm really glad to have you here, man. I've been familiar with your work for a little while now, um, particularly through uh, the documentary you made called The Sacred Hunt. But as I look over your uh, career history, man, you've been involved in a lot of things. So I was wondering if you could start off by kind of giving people a summation of what your career's been about and where your focus oh, has been. I know. Well, right? yeah, it's a, it's a big chunk. Um, life's full of surprises. And that's a wonderful thing. You know, I was explaining to somebody at the gym about an hour ago uh, that when I was a boy, a voice spoke to me and said, what you fear will come to you. I had no idea at that time what it meant, none, but I never forgot it. And now I've learned over a few few decades uh, what it means. It's really uh, it's called the law of attraction, one of God's laws, supposedly. And what it means is that what you focus on, you attract. You know, so as hunters, for example, you, you want to feed your family or you want to have a good time or whatever, but, you know, you, you pray for that for that animal to be part of your life on this day that you hunt or this week or whatever. Um, and, and what we, and, <laughs> and what you desire will come to you. See mm-hmm. now, and this, this is going to sound a little bizarre to you because you're not familiar maybe with this, this branch of uh, this cultural branch of hunting that I call the endemic, the native, the native American yeah. way. And I learned it because I actually practiced it and they became my teachers and, and the things that happened blew my mind and changed my life. Okay. Um, now I already spent quite a bit of time with them, learning from them and studying them. And I even carry a sacred pipe in the Cherokee tradition, which was, I was honored by the Cherokee for the, the work that I've done on behalf of mother earth and all her children. In some ways, the most, prof- I mean, I've had many lessons. I've died twice in this life. You talk about a lesson. Woo-hoo! <laughs> that, that goes off the scale, you know, but, yeah. um, anyway, um, I finally took seriously what they had to share with me, and I've taken many things seriously from many tribes uh, in North America already, but when they talk, told me about how they hunted, I, I had a little disbelief, but I finally decided I'm going to try it, and here's how they do it, okay? This is a Lakota. Not every tribe does exactly the same things, but it's pretty similar across the continent. Um, a person who's going to hunt spends days, often a week, in preparation and that preparation is all on the psychological and spiritual plane. He doesn't go out and, and track elk. He doesn't track deer. When these guys hunt, they don't wear camos. They don't use blinds. They don't hide. So how do they hunt? Well, they don't hunt. That's, that's, the, that's the beauty about the story I'm telling you, <laughs> is that they don't hunt. What they do is they prepare themselves for a week. And I did exactly what they do by forgiving themselves, by forgiving others, by identifying any negative energies that they hold on anything or anyone in their lifetime and forgiving, going through the actual process of actively forgiving themselves for that person. That's a cleansing process. And, uh, and it's, it's, it's a healthy thing to do no matter what, no matter what you're doing, whether you're hunting or not, it's a healthy <laughs> right. thing. But mm-hmm. um, that's what they do. Now, I tried it. 
I was living in Oregon at the time. Not a good friend, a Native American who lived on a, a ranch in central Oregon, and I was going to go hunting with him. And I'd been to his place many times. And I spent a week in, in this, this preparatory technique of forgiveness and identifying negative energies and letting go of things and coming to a point of, of bliss, of inner bliss and joy and uh, peace, really, is what it was about. And uh, I got out on, we got out in this four wheeler. We were like three seconds out from his cabin and there was a herd of elk. This is like the sun was just starting to come up okay. and I've been on his place many times. I've never seen a herd of elk or, or, or an elk at all. I saw their tracks and I saw their droppings and so on and so forth. But here we were coming on this, this test hunt. Let's, uh, you know, experiment. Let's put it that way. This experimental hunt. And, um, and there they were, there was a monarch bull at the lead, a beauty followed by about 30 cows and calves. And at the very end of this herd was a four-point mature bull elk, probably four or five years old. Um, as, as we came down this, va- this uh, valley into a, a creek bed, they were coming up the other side by the time we were getting out the bottom. And the monarch bull with all his followers, cows and calves, just headed on over the, 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 headed on over the hill. But this four-point bull stayed behind. He was directly even with me across this gulch. He stood there on all four legs with his head turned facing at me, looking me in the eyes. And he did not move. He did not move an inch. He he was frozen. (laughs) It was like a statue. (laughs) (laughs) And uh, all the other elk were gone. And my Indian friend, Dave, says to me, take him. He's yours. Now, in those words, it's part of the secret I'm telling you. Okay. He meant that elk is meant for you. He knew that. See what I mean? That's mm-hmm. the difference. And, 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 uh, and hunters have had those experiences too. Don't take me wrong. You know, I mean, I saw, I remember one guy shooting at a deer several hundred yards away by shooting an arrow straight up in the air and, and the arrow came down and landed in that deer's spine and killed it instantly. Okay. I mean, these things happen and you go, wow, that's like a miracle. Well, anyway, that bull elk stood there for the longest time and Dave kept saying, take him, take him. And I just couldn't. I was. I almost cry. I'm crying now. You know, it's like I'm so so deeply touched by this experience. Wow. This elk. This elk was, was you know playing his part for sure, and just staring at me, and waiting. And I knew that I knew he was. I knew that this was the moment I had prayed for, and asked for. And uh, I I couldn't take his life. If if my family had needed the food, don't don't mistake me. I would have. In, in a second, you know, or maybe five seconds, but, but I wouldn't have stood there and waited for two or three minutes, you know, with my sights right on the chest of, a, a, of an elk a hundred yards away. Anyway, um, finally, I put the rifle down. We didn't see another elk that day, the whole rest of that day, both of, both of us hunting. Uh, we got back to camp that night, and this shows you the respect, the level of respect that Native Americans actually have for wild things. And it was, it was an insight for me, too. Um, Dave says, well, we're cooking dinner. Uh, we're going to have to do a ceremony for that elk in the morning. And I laughed. I said, what do you mean? I let him go. And he said, listen, listen to this. This is, a, this is the truth. This is exactly what he said. That elk offered his life to you and you didn't take it. And now you have to apologize. Wow. <laughs> isn't that something isn't is. that something that's i mean that that's like doing a flip a, a reality flip on the way we live and the way we view the nature of reality it's like the difference between third dimension and fifth dimensional realities in the third mm-hmm. dimension everything fun, fun functions on opposition in the fifth dimension there is no opposition from anything or anyone see what i mean and i think we're headed mm-hmm. there now actually and a lot of the changes going on in our country and in our world are all part of that process anyway um, Native Americans taught me a lot and, um, and, and it's changed my life. It changed my life because I've always had these deep feelings for nature, no matter what, whether I was hunting or fishing or not, you know, I've so always had this deep connection. I've been blessing my food for a long time, everything I ever eat. And I think, I actually thank the spirit of the animal that gave its body to me. Mm-hmm. You know, if it's a cow, I, I actually, in my mind say, thank you, cow. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And I picture myself sort of with my head up next to the cow's head and petting it, you know. I mean, I'm thinking because I know that creature died. I've been to a slaughterhouse, and I've killed animals too as a hunter. But I, I watched these animals die in a slaughterhouse, and it isn't pretty, let me tell you. Yeah. Yeah. It isn't at all like you imagine. It's a, ooh, it's just a, ooh, <laughs> kind of makes you shiver. You know, it's done with such cold lack, lack of feeling and respect and, and, and gratitude. 
and I and I've heard I've heard pigs scream for minutes after they've been shot in the brain, and they lay there on the ground trying to trying to get up and run, and they can't, and they scream and they scream, and it's 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 amazing, you know. A trip to a slaughterhouse could turn a lot of people into a vegetarian, and I'm not trying to do that. You know, I'm not trying to do that. But what I'm saying is that, you know, there's no respect. See what I mean? And mm-hmm. that's got to be offensive to somebody who has that deep feeling for animals. I've had friends who, you know, as I have myself, raised animals and eaten them. Don't mistake me. I'm not, I'm not against that, you know, but how you do it is important. And, and that how you do it comes down to a question of, of where, where's your heart? Are you in a state of gratitude? Are you in a state of, of deep gratitude to the creator and to this beautiful earth, this beautiful earth that creates our home and gives us our food and the air that we breathe? It's, it's, a, beautiful, it's a beautiful life. And uh, to honor it is just, I, I can't imagine living without doing it. You know, it's like, <laughs> I, I just, I, I, can't, I can't do it. You know, I can't sit here and keep it straight. I wish I didn't cry every time I do a radio interview about this subject. <laughs> but, but anyway, it's, it's just a measure of the depth of feeling I have for these creatures. Knowing, knowing as I have from actual experience that an animal will actually give up its life for me, you know, for me and my family. Uh, wow, actually having the experience, you know, is one thing. Hearing about it's another. And uh, the actual experience, of course, is what changes your life. And it changed my life. And it's changed it ever since. And it will continue to change it, I have no doubt. All I'm saying is gratitude is where it's at. The more you're grateful for, as a Lakota shaman told me, the more you'll receive to be grateful for. Mm-hmm. And that's the attitude. The attitude is, you know, you get on the right on the framework, right framework here, and you attract what it is you like. You attract what it is you want, just like that law of attraction. You know, what what you fear will come to you, but what you desire will also come to you. You know, whatever you focus on will come to you. And that's how powerful we are, and that's how powerful God made us. And that's how powerful our minds and our hearts are. And we learn to think with our hearts and not just our heads. Uh, we're way ahead in this game. You know. Uh, imagine, imagine somebody reaching my age and uh, and not not having tears over the yeah. taking of lives of animals. I did surveys on thousands of hunters in Canada and the United States, and none of these were actually they were reported in a book called um, "From Boys to Men of Heart: uh, Hunting as a Rite of Passage." I interviewed a lot of hunters in Alberta and British Columbia, but also Vermont, and uh, I asked every, every one of the male hunters. This I had to give them a slightly different survey. And in, in, in the responses of the male hunters, I asked what they got out of a lifetime because the average age of the people who responded was like 54 years old. Okay. So they've been out there. Most of them have been out since they were teenagers. That's the usual story. And their uncle took them or their brother or their dad or somebody, their grandpa. And they, they all said basically the two most – I had all these universal – universal qualities um, that we admire in human beings and in ourselves. And I had them check off which ones were most important. The two that came up most, most often from most of these respondents was that uh, respect, for, respect, respect for life, respect for nature, respect for deer, respect for pheasants, respect, respect, respect. And, and I think that's powerful. And many, many hunters will use that word. If you know, you know this yourself. You've interviewed too many of them. And, and the same from anybody who lives off the earth, uh, respects the earth and respects what it does. And, and what it is, is a living thing. And the other one is that, that I thought was beautiful was that the vast majority of these hunters also felt that, that it, taught, it gave them connection. It gave them a sense of connection with what is. I am a part of this life. I am a part of it, you know, and a critical part of it. And, and so it's connection and it's respect. And that's what it comes down to. To me, that's what Wild Fed is all about. It's about connection and respect. How do you address the mismatch that you see when, because first I just want to say, I, I'm, I'm, my heart's singing listening to you say these things. I'm in agreement with you. And when I go to Cabela's or I go to Bass Pro Shop or I watch the hunting shows, you see almost the opposite. You see the elevation of the personal ego so much. You see yeah. the... You see the 
the pitting oneself against the animal in a competitive way to demonstrate, you know, prowess. And you see, yeah. now I know right. there's a change underway and I can feel it. We're part of it. I, I know it's happening, but how, do, how over the years have you addressed that mismatch? Because I, I notice when I talk to a lot of hunters one-on-one, they share the kind of things you just said, but when they're all together collectively, it's like right. almost like a big ego game that happens. Sure, it is. It's like guys getting together after a game and talking about the, uh, you know, the victory or whatever. So, uh, yeah, it's an ego. It's ego energy for sure. You're right about that. And um, I actually am, believe it or not, <laughs> am the only person that I know of, at least in the history of the world, who's actually written a serious, uh, serious document on the origins of trophy hunting. Oh, wow. now the reason that's important is because it's getting it to the question that you ask. Okay. Um, and trophy hunting itself is, 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 uh, is basically universal in one form or another. It may not be among the Hindus, but among all other cultures and, and so on, it, it's, it's a way of life. A man can't earn his ability to claim manhood until he proves his ability to provide for a family. That's where it all begins. And you look at all the native, native peoples on earth to this day, they still practice this trophy hunt. Uh, an adolescent age, a young teenage, he might be, he might be 15, 16, 17, 18 years of age, but he goes on his, his, his first hunt to, a, to a, becoming an adult. And if, if he's successful and kills an animal large enough to, to know that it would feed more than, you know, his dog at home, um, then, then he's made it. He's that, that's where the, that's where trophy hunting begins. You prove yourself, you prove yourself worthy. See, mm, that's yeah. what it is. I mean, I, I can now say that I'm worthy to, to marry a woman and to raise a family. That's really what it means. And uh, that's what the trophy was all about and still is all about in all those cultures. And it's something they take seriously. There's been men among the Bush, Kalahari Bushmen who've never married. They're 60 and 70 years old. They never married because they never got a trophy. They never bagged a trophy. See what I mean? Wow. And in their culture, if you can't bag a, if you can't bag a trophy, you know, you're not, you're not exactly worthy, you know. And I mean, you may be worthy in other ways, and perhaps they respect you anyway. But you won't be able to to be a man and marry and have children. You know, that's a pretty big measure of success. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, that wow. that's that's kind of where it all starts. Okay. Because I wanted wondered myself, why do men do this? Why do people do this? And then it, it, I'm, I, I myself practiced it my, when I was thirteen. I shot my first first animal it was a f- um, female a hen a hen mallard. And, um, and I shot her pretty close range and I was out in a typical hunting environment and so on and so forth. And I was prepared for it. I'd been prepared by my, by my grandfather to how to do it properly. And and also to respect, show respect to nature when you're in it. And, um, and I, I took that animal. I learned, believe it or not, (laughs) I took that. There used to be a thing at the end of the Boy Scouts, uh, uh, magazine, about doing, you know, making trophy specimens, you know, learning how to stuff animals. And you could do a course, uh, a mail, mail in course on that subject. Well, I took it. I took it so that I could mount that female mallard. Um, <laughs> that first, yeah, no kidding. I did. Right. And, and I made a beautiful specimen of her. I had her on a nice wood plaque with her wings spread and, you know, in the air and so on and so forth. Uh, and that was my way of honoring her. You know, that was my way of saying thank you. You're my badge. You know, you've given me the right to claim manhood and adulthood and to begin to live a different kind of life on this planet. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So for me, it's a matter of gratitude. Now, here's things went astray, you know, obviously. And that was it was one thing to prove yourself worthy to be a man who can marry and support a family. It's another thing then for that 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 killing of, of something to to and to to give you high social status within your society. And that's what, unfortunately, what a lot of hunters are doing, whether they're conscious of it or not, you know, it's, it's, it's it's sort of where they're getting, they're they're getting their, their marks, their, um, their trophies, their, their manhood, their stars uh, on the page, you know, from having killed a, a bigger animal, a better animal, more of them or whatever, you know, it becomes, it becomes an ego trip. And, and it's not, it isn't about becoming a man, a man in proper relationship any longer. It's about, I've got more than you do. I'm better mm-hmm. than you are because of, I killed this and I killed that and you didn't, you know? And so it went astray. It went astray. And my guess is it probably started with domesticated animals. My guess is that that's when this all got corrupted. It was one thing to be able to have to kill an antelope to prove that you could feed a family. 
It's another thing when you start defending your cows and protecting them against predators and against other humans who want to steal them and eat them also. Then it becomes a direct competition for your resource. That's head when of war cattle, right? How many head of yeah. cattle you have, right? Yes, yes, exactly. Of wealth. Mm-hmm. Right, exactly. You know, we, well, I got 120 head in my herd, you know, or whatever, you know. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> and any lion takes a step towards my my compound, he's going to be in trouble because me and my boys are going to be there with our spears, you know, or whatever it is. But uh, that's that's when it seems to me because somebody asked me once in an interview in Costa Rica, what what are, where did our problems begin? And I said with the first cow. Yeah, <laughs> you know? I always say when they first started putting wheat seeds in the ground, you know, like that whole right. agricultural revolution, right? Yeah, well, that's true. That's true. Well, anyway, um, yeah, I think things, things have gone astray, and it's a shame, and, and it has become an ego trip. Um, and, and that's a shame, too, because it's it's bigger than that. It's much bigger than that. You know, having an animal surrender itself to you is 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 humbling. Whew. <laughs> it, uh, it, it knocks yeah. your socks off, as they say. You know, you, you, my goodness, I had no idea that, you know, I could have this connection with a wild creature I'd never met before until this moment. And it sought me out, you know. So what kind of world do I live in here? Is it the kind of world I've been explained to in, in school about how the nature of reality is and and to believe that? I don't think it is. I have a doctorate in, in, uh, in science, but I don't believe that science has the answers. You know, I've died twice in this life. You come back from an experience like that, and everything looks very, very different than it ever did before. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's it, it really, it's a rebirth in a sense. You know, yeah, it's a spiritual true. rebirth, really. Yeah. And uh, wow, you know, in fact, in, in one of them, um, I, I, my body was laying there on the floor. I'd been poisoned accidentally. And I was laying on the floor, and my ex-wife and my buddy, George, were leading over the top of me, yelling, Randy, 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 you know, trying to get me to come too. And and I never I never, quite, never ever thought to myself, well, how can I see him when my eyes are over there closed? On the, <laughs> you know? <laughs> how does this, this work? <laughs> how can I hear them with my ears and my ears, and I'm unconscious? Anyway, um, <laughs> the point is that <laughs> that um, – it, ta- it taught me a lot. And I had another one where, wow, I was shown the nature of the universe three years before the first scientific theory about the nature of uh, the origin of our universe. You know, you've heard the Big Bang Theory, right? Mm-hmm, of course. Well, um, yeah. And uh, and I accepted that as long as we all do. You know, we figure, well, these scientists know something. And that's that was their th- theory, at least, about the origin of the universe. There was a big explosion. Well, the first thing I was shown in this other death experience was that the universe contracts and expands. It's like I was given the front row seat of the universe <laughs> and I could see it contract like a ball and then expand and then contract down to almost nothing and then expand again. And I got the message. The message was, this is the nature of reality. It expands and contracts like a heartbeat. See, mm-hmm. it's like yeah. the universe is like a heart. And um, three years later, the first proposal that came out in 1978 uh, in Science Journal the first proposal from any scientist, so maybe it wasn't just a big bang. Maybe it, maybe the universe contracts and expands. Right. Well, I'd been shown that that was so, you know. And then not only that, but then I experienced my actual creation because this is hard for us to, to believe because of our third dimensional conditioning. But life is uh, life's full of surprises. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and, and it's much bigger than we imagine. We keep trying to put it in all these little you know, uh, categories and name them and, and, and recite them and, and mention the person who made the theory and who holds that trophy or whatever, you know, and, uh, I don't know. It's, uh, life is so, so big, so incredible, so awesome, so beautiful, so perfect. You know, it's like you realize when you die and come back to life that, um, you never had anything to fear ever wow. yeah well, that's you know i mean it's just like wow and i i laughed the happiest laughter of my life after i came <laughs> back from that i really did i laid there on the couch and uh and i laughed and i laughed and i laughed and i laughed and for six months i was in a state of, of elevated consciousness i knew everybody who was going to call before the phone rang i knew what they were going to say you know and that's the way my life was at that time for months and uh, it was beautiful, and what a wonderful gift, because it, it shifted my, my view of the nature of reality into a much higher one, a much more spiritual one, a much more loving one, and, a, and certainly one that gives, says thanks to the celery that I chew in my mouth. 
<laughs> and I, uh, I've had some plant medicine experiences that I, make me kind of identify with, help me to identify with what you're saying. I want to ask you this question about young boys and kids, because part of what we were just talking about, about you just said like uh, that there's nothing to fear, but right. so many people have been dissociated from death. Like we don't, I didn't grow up hunting. I mean, thankfully I found it in my thirties. Um, mm-hmm. I was not around death. And so then that fear is always there because you're not exposed to it. Um, right. What do you think the impact of a culture where boys don't have the rite of passage of hunting and uh, oh, you know, how do we, how do we address that? Boy, that's a good, you know, that's, I don't know, Daniel. I'm surprised. I'm, I'm sitting here in shock that I actually met somebody now who asked a bigger question than I've ever asked. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. I think so, you've addressed this now. <laughs> no, I don't know if I have or not. I, uh, if I have, I haven't done it adequately. But I, I love the question, okay? And I admire you for holding the question and for bringing it up. And, uh, and I'm not sure how to answer it, to tell you the truth. What, what, can, what can we use as a substitute? In the in the ties in the lives of especially of young boys uh, who aren't in hunting families and don't have that kind of cultural experience is that what you're asking really yeah yeah what, and what are yeah, what are the impacts right. like yeah. when you look at the world today or do you think you're seeing many of the impacts of boys who become adult males who haven't had that initiation and are we seeing the pathologies played out in the world stage because they haven't been raised. Uh, with this important human lineal experience, boy, you're you're really, you're really on track here, man. And I, and, I'm, and I honor you, and I and and I praise you, and I I'm grateful to you. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, boy, <laughs> I don't even know where to begin with this one. Uh, you got me. I'm in the corner. <laughs> <laughs> but you have written on this topic, no, about the idea oh, I, of the right yes, of I, for, for boys, right? And so. Yeah, I have. Yeah. Well, uh, here's what here's what I think happens. I think things go awry. Uh, what happens is, see, in the same way that trophy hunting turned into, I mean, that trophy hunting and the legitimate trophy hunting, meaning I'm preparing myself for manhood. I'm preparing myself to be an adult. I'm preparing myself to be a provider. That's one thing. It's another thing then to say, well, I'm going to go out and kill, you know, 12 deer this year. I'm only going to at least I'm only going to unleash 15 arrows. You see what I mean? Yeah. It's, a, it's a form of trophy. And it's, it's a, like a, a kind of competition with yourself and with other people. And that's where things go wrong. That's where things go wrong in our relationship with the earth. Who would ever think that you could go out and an animal like a deer or an elk would actually come up and wait for you to take its life so you could eat and feed your family? How many people think that's even possible? See what I'm yeah. saying? Mm-hmm. So we're so far we're so far outside the box of, of what I see as reality that I don't know what the cure is. But I feel sorry for the kids that grow up who have no sense whatsoever of what it means to step into the light. Mm-hmm. What it means to have your heart open, what it means that that life isn't about simply collecting more trophies, you know, and more red stars in your book at school or whatever. It's, it's, it's something much bigger than that. It's about finding inner peace, you know, and a connection, a peaceful, loving connection with all that is. Can, can a person do that? Well, a person can, but it isn't easy and it's hard. It makes harder every day in this world. And, uh, all I can tell you is I was blessed in a sense that I had uh, parents and grandparents uh, who took me under their wing, literally, and um, and exposed me to things and, and had me contemplate things and, and wonder and, uh, and and be appreciative and be grateful and so on and so forth. And so now how, how, life, how different would my life be today if I hadn't had those people in my family? I can't really say. All I can say is I feel sorry for those kids boys who grow up thinking that life is about, you know, getting another letter in basketball or life, or life, the meaning of life is about, you know, having the highest score, you know, of anybody who played the game that day uh, or whatever. It's not about those things. It's not about any of that things, but that's the way it's become. It's become an ego trip. You're right. I mean, that, so how do we do it? How do we correct it? I'm not sure, but I know that living close. Okay. Let me, let me, okay. This is, this is a perfect answer to your question. Okay. I had a friend who headed up a project in southern Idaho, and he took out boys, troubled boys, kids that had got in trouble, city kids for the most part, obviously. 
And he took them out for two weeks in the wilderness. They had to support themselves. They had to feed themselves. And they did that. They did that by killing a snake and, and cooking on a fire. Uh, one boy killed a marmot with his knife. They were allowed to take a pocket knife along into the field, and that was all. Everything they got out there, they, they either caught or they trapped or, 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 or hit it with a stick or did something. But they had to provide their own food or they didn't eat. And let me tell you, they were hungry and they worked hard to feed themselves, and they did. <laughs> You know, and it changed their view of reality. The, the success rate of those, of those boys after having these wilderness experience where they had to also feed themselves, that's the key element. That's why the, that's one reason I, I'm interested in your show because it's called Wild Fed. These boys were wild fed. They got hungry. They had to kill something and they had to cooperate to do it too. See what I mean? It wasn't just, oh, I'm going to go out and get a bigger rabbit than you or I'm going to kill a kill groundhog bigger than yours or whatever. It wasn't competition at all. Right. It was, we got to do this together so we eat tonight. We had a common cause, you know, and uh, and it changed those those boys' lives. Uh, their success. Uh, a year later, they did follow up surveys on those boys that went back into quote society, and uh, they didn't get in trouble again. Not one case <laughs> for, for in the first year, at least after they returned from the wilderness. And um, that that's that study. It wasn't a study. It was a program. That program impressed me immensely. And I think, sure, sure, you've got to have some mentors out there who are sensitive to these things and really care about them. People who think the kind of ask the kind of questions that you yourself do um, in order for them to work. But that's what I think is partly the answer. I think kids ought to grow up in some way or another having to having to live off the earth directly, as these kids did in this Southern Idaho experiment um, to get on with life and to have a deep sense of connection with life. I think you have to take life to do that. I remember um, my friend who ran on this project in southern Idaho. Um, he had a, one boy on his trip. He said was, he was the worst shape of any he'd ever known. He said he didn't speak to anybody for days. Uh, well, they were out in the wilderness, and they were hiking every day and moving to a new camp and on and on. And finally, the, the day came when he had created a spear by wrapping tape around a knife on the end of a stick. And using it to spear a, a marmot, what we call groundhogs in the Midwest, they call them marmots out west. Um, he speared it, and he brought it back, and it was dying. It laid in his lap and took its last breath with his eyes looking in his boy's eyes. And the boy wept for two days. He was so full of pain and anger, he didn't even know it himself. Mm. And then the killing of that animal changed his life radically. And in a way, the guy who ran the project, just as I do myself, to you know, especially after my Native American experience, I go, "This is no accident." You know, there's more meaning and purpose in this life than we give it credit for, and we and we're stupid because we don't. Mm. But um, that boy's life was changed by that animal dying in his lap. Now, yes, he ate it. Yes, he ate it gladly. I'm sure but it changed his life. Two days later, he was a different person. And all I can say is I wish every kid in trouble uh, could have an experience like that, a life-changing experience, some, somewhat along those lines. And maybe the, it comes down to being wild fed, just like the title of your, your show. For us, it's, you know, what, I'm always joking that the way humans live on the planet today, it's almost like they're astronauts from somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And they come down here I and think that's true. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We, we act as if we don't have any, you know, I'm, I'm always saying to people, Hey, like we're all indigenous to the planet. We're all native yep. to earth, mm -hmm. but until you eat something from the earth directly, it's hard to know that. And so right. it seems that's like right. these, that thing you just said that you think to access some of this, you have to then kill and eat something because that's how yeah. you rekindle that connection. But it's counterintuitive to so many people today who think yeah. that if they kill, that that's going to bring darkness into their hearts and not right, realizing exactly. what you're saying, that it actually can cleanse the darkness from your heart. Uh, yes, absolutely. Yeah. We'll get right back to the show in a moment. But first, new episodes of the Wild Fed TV show are airing each Monday on the Outdoor Channel at 7 p.m. As the host, I'm a little biased, but I think we're bringing something really fresh to TV. A show that not only honors the species we're hunting, fishing, and foraging, but also recognizes and celebrates human beings as part of the ecosystem. So check us out on Mondays at 7 p.m. East and 11 p.m. East on the Outdoor Channel. 
Season one of the Wild Fed TV show is 10 episodes, and this week, Outdoor Channel is airing episode five, featuring iguana hunting and coconut foraging in the Florida Keys. And next week, we'll feature lobstering, halibut fishing, seaweed foraging, and culminate in the meal for my wedding to my incredible wife, Avani. If you're like me and you don't have cable, you can use FriendlyTV.com. That's F-R-N-D-L-Y TV.com. It's the word friendly with no vowels. It's less than seven bucks a month, and it gives you access to the Outdoor Channel shows as they air, as well as some other networks, too. And for our Canadian friends and family, you can see us on the Sportsman's Channel Canada, Tuesdays at 8 p.m. Eastern. Also, I'll be hosting some social media live streams for Outdoor Channel after the episodes air, so be sure to follow WildFed on social media or subscribe to our twice-a-month newsletter, The Subsistence, to be notified about those. Now, back to the show. You get it at the highest levels of spiritual awareness, there's no death anyway. See, Mm -hmm. there's the death of bodies, yes, but that's not all that exists, fortunately, Mm -hmm. you know. And that's what you, that's what the wonderful, beautiful thing about having a, quote, near-death experience. And it isn't a near-death. It's an experience of death that you happen to survive, you know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it wasn't like a close call with death. It was death. <laughs> and, you know, you happen to wake up. And, um, and, and so it, it takes that, that kind of medicine to somehow wake us up, shake us up, move us, uh, get us connected. And that's one, one reason I applaud. The programs they have in schools, they started a few years ago, uh, uh, everywhere across this country, almost, where kids had their own gardens in a third grade class at, you know, the junior high school or whatever, you know, the kids had a garden and uh, their teacher had to oversee it or whatever, but they got to plant radishes and put that seed in the ground and watch it pop up and ultimately take it home and share it with their family and eat it, you know, um, those things that we took for granted the way I grew up anyway, in my time and time, time and place, uh, these kids are growing up without more and more kids. Every generation are growing up without those experiences in their lives. And I think we're all hurting because of it. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't care if it's a radish that you grew at, at school or what it is, but if you grew it and you had something to do with this life and its livelihood, you're going to have a deep respect for the earth, for the rain, for the sun <coughs> and for life itself. And for the and for the thing it is that you grew and ate, you're going to be grateful and you're going to be thankful and you're going to feel like you're a part of life rather than separate from it. Do you see a a, a change underway, or how is it still so far away? Do we have? Do you see us reconciling these indigenous beliefs and this Western belief, or are they so fundamentally irreconcilable because they're they are like you said before, kind of opposite ways of viewing the nature of reality? Yeah. Well, I've, I've wondered about that a lot, as you can imagine, and I wish I had an e- easy, simple answer, and I wish I had a, 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 an uplifting answer. I don't think that we're on track at all as far as doing that, as far as doing, you know, developing programs or projects or whatever, educational experiences that, that bring something out of the person. I'm going to take a little tangent here uh, and explain what I mean, okay? I was teaching an education class in Wyoming and somebody, they roped me into teaching an education class when I'd never taken a course even in education, even though I taught a lot of the university courses. But these women were all getting ready to go out to become student teachers. It was their last term in school. There were 30 of them in my class. One of them, oddly enough, grew up two blocks away from me in central Illinois. (laughs) (laughs) Anyway, um, and I asked them a question on their, on their first, first essay. I want you to write an essay on your favorite teacher and why that teacher was your favorite. Every one of those 30 women used exactly the same word to describe their favorite teacher. Exactly the same word. Enthusiasm. You know what the word means, Daniel? It means the God within. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Thus. The God within. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so then the next week I had them write an essay on the content they could remember from their favorite teacher. Every one of those 30 women did not remember one iota of content from their favorite teacher who changed their life dramatically. Wow. Wow. Now, isn't that fascinating? Okay. And then, um, then I wondered, well, how is that possible? Because it's not about content. It's about something else. It's about that enthusiasm, that spirit, that attitude that the teacher had. That, that's why those, all those 30 women were getting ready to go out and become student teachers. Mm. It was their last term in school. They had come that far because that teacher in their life had changed them inside, had made them a different person by their enthusiasm, by the God within. 
So then anyone looked up another word, education, the verb to educate, comes from the uh, Latin uh, term educar, which means to draw out of. Mm. Education does not mean to put into. It means to draw out of. And what the Lakota say about that is we're all born with a care package. We're all born with something <laughs> to care about in this world. Isn't that fascinating? Wow, and they yeah. believed that long, long before there was any care packages <laughs> being mailed between countries. You know what I mean? They saw that. They recognized that. They know that everybody's got a purpose. You know, they're coming here with a with a with a, a, a an objective. You know, in mind for their own development, if nothing else. And uh, I think that kind of hits it on the head. That's exactly what that's 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 what we need to change within our society. Is it's not about teaching somebody what they ought to know. It's about helping somebody discover what they already know inside and developing it for the sake of the rest of us. You know, wow. <laughs> it's yeah. about recognizing that we're born with gifts that we carry gifts within our being that we are gifts. You know, um, and 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 everything you eat is a gift too. Every radish you ever ate was a gift. You know, a gift from Mother Earth or whatever, or the or the or the radish nation. But um, it comes down to a different. It comes down to that 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 way of endemic thinking. Endemic thinking is it's like a, a shaman told me once, Lakota medicine man. He said, "The more you're grateful for, the more you receive to be grateful for." I would love to go. You you just use that language, the radish nation, and I want to I want to flesh that out a little bit. If you could. Ex- explore a little bit for us what that means, how you, how that endemic view of different species um, mm-hmm. as non human persons, because I feel like right now we're in this, it's just humans versus everything else, except maybe our dogs, you know? Yeah. Oh, I know. Yeah. Well, you're right. You're right about that. And, uh, and dogs, of course, and who ends up being our most important teachers in many cases in our lifetime are dogs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, really, really, they, you know, we don't eat them. Your heart. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. No kidding. I mean, look at, look at what they do. My God, I have a little tiny ankle biter will he'll throw his life into the jaws of a, of a bear or a cougar, you mm-hmm. know, to, and save your, your, your child's life. You know, it will do that easily and readily at the snap of a finger. You know, you talk about love. There it is. (laughs) Wow. I mean, no kidding. It really is. I mean, dogs, dogs are among our our greatest teachers. I really truly believe that. No kidding. Mm. Um, Yeah, I forgot what your question was. Uh, Yeah, I was asking you about using that language nation to describe another species because it really reframes our idea about living things. Right. Yes, it does. And it's, it's wonderful that the way the Native Americans do that. It's absolutely beautiful. It does get you thinking about the fact that we are, that we are different nations and uh, there were all many nations living under, in, under one roof, under one sky, under one sun. And, uh, and I think that's exactly the direction we have to go and we need to go and that we are going. I think the fifth, dim- I think we're heading to fifth dimension. I've already mentioned that, but I think we're on our way there and, and it won't necessarily all be an easy ride. But once we are there, it's going to be a real different reality. It's going to be that, you know, you don't have to kill anything to eat it, first of all, <laughs> <laughs> you know, the, because there won't be any killing. See what I mean? There, the, in the fifth dimension, there's, there's, no, uh, there's no conflict. It doesn't exist. And so it's not as though you can have a conflict of interest with an elk. You see what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> Why not the fourth? Why the fifth? How, how are we jumping the fourth dimension? Well, it's that's a whole that, that's a really that, that's it's a fascinating show. question. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but it's we're going to have to kind of yeah. Well, the dream state is basically the fourth dimension. Okay, got it. Okay. Whatever that's worth. Yeah, yeah. So we're kind of moving through the fourth into the fifth, and it'll it'll it, and we're on our way there, and, and we're making all kinds of adjustments. Even even all the political things going on on this planet recently, and economic things are all part of this evolutionary process. Um, you know, the the Mayans talked about this. There's twenty six thousand year cycle. Uh, we're ending one cycle, uh, mm-hmm. the worst one in, in the in the. There's four four different cycles. We're ending the, the the most difficult one and starting in the most beautiful one, the most glorious one, the most fulfilling one. Now, um, and, and I'm happy. I let spend a lot of time with the minds. They taught me a lot. Let me tell you, th- those people are very, very, very spiritual and very serious and about life and and beautiful in many ways anyway but it is the, the dark it are, is the darkest before the dawn sometimes right yes so it's it is yes there's no no now. doubt there's absolutely no doubt that that's where we're at we're in that dark in that dark cavity 
you know, before the light breaks through. But the light is breaking through, and it's going to break through, you know, us individually, obviously, and that's what's going to change this world. But it's love. It's the love in your heart, you know. How many of us pray every day? I take deep breaths to do it. I've been starting this lately, and it really works for me. I take a deep breath. I hold it, count for a 10, and I let out. I do that 10 times when I get up in the morning. My feet, first, first thing, thing to do when my feet is on the, on the floor of the, next to the bed. And that, that breathing, that breathing exercise, breathing in deep, holding your breath and letting it out slowly is a ritual. And that ritual recognizes the, the nature of life itself. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and, and we, don't, we don't give time where we just honor life. How many, times do we, how many times do we thank the sun? How many times a day when you're outside or walking or, or fishing or hunting or camping or biking or whatever you're doing, how many times do we thank the sun? How would, we wouldn't be here if it wasn't for the sun, would we? Wouldn't have a life that we can understand or relate to, that's for mm-hmm. sure. Um, and so there, that whole question of gratitude is is really fundamental. And I think that we're going to have a, uh, a a real evolutionary jump. Uh, I think it's un, it's un, it's going on now. It just there's more difficult. It's like a birth, you know. Uh, the birth's horrible until the baby's born, and then there it is, and it's like, oh man, that wasn't so bad. Now was it? <laughs> I was, something I want to say about the, about prayer that's really interesting to me um, is that when you when you start to pray in earnest, it's not like the you don't have to wait very long for reality to respond. It responds so quickly that it's almost like, why have I been trying to do things under my own strength for so long when there's such a more an easier and more blessed way to live in the world? Right. Yeah. Well, we're growing up inside a, in a cult, in a scientific culture, which basically teaches us whether it's intends to or not is not the question. That's the effect. The effect is it teaches us, teaches us about separation. Mm-hmm. I'm separate from you. I'm separate from this. I'm separate from the planet, you know, and the earth. And no one, how many people in science acknowledge that the earth itself, like the native peoples of this planet, is a being, you know, that she's, she's a, a marvelous, wonderful mother for us. See what I mean? That this is how we keep missing all the boats because we're not in that any wavelength. And I don't know how to correct it. I wish I did. Um, it's interesting that, you know, the, you saw that film, the last of the Mohegans, right? Yeah. <laughs> Just last week I watched it again. Yeah. Did you really? Wow. Yeah. I love it. Well, it's film, very yeah. powerful. It is. It is a very powerful film. Now there's a scene in it though, which in my mind, you know, gave me a little bit of trouble. And that is when they're hunting that elk in the first part of the movie. And there's three hunters out there and, and so on and so forth. Well, they sort of hunt it the way the Native Americans do, but they sort of don't. They sort of hunt it the way uh, white men do and the way the Natives, they sort of mix it up. And, and when the Native Americans hunt, there is no pursuit of the animal. You're not chasing it down. You know, it's coming to you and it cooperates with you. And, um, uh, that was the only part of that film, I guess, that about troubled me. But on the other hand, that film also appealed to millions of people, didn't it? Yeah. Wow. Did. You know. Wow. I mean, it was that was that was a that was a time changer. That one. Ooh. And and rightly so. Oh well, I know what I was going to show. Yeah. <laughs> Back to our discussion a minute ago. I was on a radio show. Art Bell. You remember Art Bell? Oh yeah, of course. Yeah. Okay. All right. And I was on the show for some reason six times, and. um, I was talking one night about orca whales, which I've made friends with in the wild, and, and they've been great teachers for me, and they're incredible, awesome beings, very highly evolved, really the rulers of the seas. They're giant dolphins. They can kill anything in and around the sea with impunity. They can kill a blue whale. Can you believe that? Orcas are wow. giant dolphins. They can kill a blue whale. Gee, many Christmas. I mean, they're awesome predators, too. But anyway, um, I got through with my talk, and, and uh, Art says, well, what can we do, Dr. Eaton, to, to make sure that we take care of the whales in the oceans? And I said, get more kids outdoors hunting and fishing. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And then some woman called in immediately. And she was, boy, she was on the, she was, hot she was really Oh, man. Oh, boy, was she ever. She was explained that she was a Buddhist and, and on and on. And all I'm doing is teaching kids, you know, um, anger and aggression and, you know, everything they don't need to know, see, by encouraging them to participate in hunting and fishing. And my answer to her was, interestingly enough, maybe, well, what do you think um, Jimmy Carter and Nelson Mandela would say about that? They both won the Nobel Peace Prize, and they're both avid hunters. 
Mm. <laughs> total, total quiet on the other end. No comment. Wow. You know? And and that says a lot. And, and I mean, you know, it's like, wow. Um, you know, some of, many of our culture heroes, we don't recognize that hunting has played a role in their development in life. I right. mean, Jimmy Carter is the most humanitarian, you know, man has been in the White House maybe ever. <laughs> Wow. You know, I mean, he's still out there pounding people's and pounding nails in people's roofs, you know, and he's probably 90 some years old now. I mean, what can you say? You know, there's a man with heart. Yeah. <laughs> I, I wanted to ask you about orcas because uh, and here's specifically why I'm there's it's easy for people to disregard and and not show respect to many species because they don't perceive that animal as having an intelligence that they can relate to. Right. And when we start to talk about whales, it's almost like a parallel line of intelligent mammals to us in some mm -hmm. way, you know? Yep. And yep. I wanted to, to hear a little bit about those relationships that you've had, those experiences you've had with whales, uh, because I think that that can really, they're one of the gateways through which people can enter into a new paradigm as, and how they relate to other living things that are non-human. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You know, I, I agree with you completely. Uh, you know, it's like, the, to me, the orca whale is the counterpart to the human in the ocean. Wow. In other words, it has the same role, basically, that we have uh, as caretakers, at least in the big plan, okay, as caretakers of the earth, as humans of the caretakers of the physical earth, you know, the, the land, let's put it that way. And, um, yeah, the orcas are, uh, they, uh, you know, I told you they can kill a blue whale, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, isn't that phenomenal? And, and the, the white shark it, I mean, as well, right? Oh, oh, yeah, with ease. Yeah, yeah, they, they, yeah, they feed on, they don't even have a challenge with them. Eat those uh, livers, yeah. I think, right? Yeah, yeah, no shit. Anyway, um, you're right about the, 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 the cetaceans, as they're called, being a doorway that allows us to expand our comprehension of ourselves and our uniqueness. And it also, what we also have in common with creatures like that, like the dolphins and the orcas, you know, I agree with that completely. Um, or orcas, I don't know the relationship that orcas have with humans is, is dynamite. It just, it blew my mind to tell you the truth, the things I kept learning day after day. And I experienced month after month, year after year, um, the native peoples of the Pacific Northwest, from Seattle North all the way up to the Arctic Circle, speak as one when they say that the orcas never attacked us until we attacked them. Then they attacked us back. But only, they all say this, but only the culprits of our society who had actually attacked them. Hmm. Imagine that. Wow. In other words, somebody went out and killed some orca whales. Well, guess who got killed by the orcas? Just those individuals who actually killed the orca. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> and I know I laugh, but you know, it's like, it's so, it's so, damn, you've been around those creatures a while. I mean, it, and you believe it, you know, because they, they have that, that awareness and that intelligence. They, I don't know how they do it, but they can literally read my mind, you know, um, when I'm on, out of the water in the, in, in the air environment and they're in the water, they still do it. I don't know how they do it. What do you mean? I mean by, I can you give us an example? Yeah. Uh, I had just spent a month with two orcas, the last two orcas ever captured in Puget Sound, the sea off Seattle, right? And um, and they were released, and they, they hoped to track them and so on and so forth. And the orcas had a different idea, and they, they, they ditched them. <laughs> but anyway. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and uh, I went to visit this aquarium in Victoria, which is right across the, the water, very close really to Seattle. It's in, in Victoria, British Columbia. And... Um, there was a, an aquarium there called Sea Land of Victoria. And the, the aquarium itself was a series of pontoons with a big net hanging down between them. And that net went into the sea. So the orcas that lived there actually were living in the sea. It's just that their containment, their containment was, you know, dependent upon these pontoons that sort of helped the, held the net up. But otherwise, they were actually in the sea and not in an aquarium itself. Um, now, this, this particular orca whale was already starting his act when I walked into the aquarium. There were 300 people standing around his long pool. 
And he was up there with his keeper. And this is what you see in many aquariums. But the orca had its jaws wide open. It was showing, this is the part of the show where you show the humans your teeth, okay? And the orca had its jaws wide open. And they have big, they have 50 big teeth. <laughs> and, uh, and, and and so the orca was showing showing off his teeth. And um, and I'm wa- I walk down around the end of the pool of the pond, the, 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 the tank that, whatever you call it, the pool, I guess, that he was in. Now, what's interesting is that these 300 people are already signing, standing up against this fence watching. I walked around them. This is the first time I'd ever been to this facility. I went to the very end of it and squeezed in between two people. This orca whale broke out of his show, his usual show, swam to the end of the, the tank that he was in, came up out of the water, and gave a, a fine spray of water from his mouth over my face. Wow. No way. You know? Yeah. Wow. And, yeah. uh, and I had my camera going. <laughs> I was taking, <laughs> taking a camera of his, of his, of his spitting on me or whatever. And uh, the, when the show was all over, his keeper, his trainer, came up to me and he said, do you know him? And I said, no, sir. This is the first time I've ever been here. And he said, why do you do that? And I explained to him, well, I just spent a month with two other orca whales over in the San Juan Islands. And, uh, and I connected with them powerfully. And I did. They gave me a psychic a telepathic message once they came by me and they rolled on their sides and they put their heads up out of the water and they looked me right in the eyes. And, they, and the message I got from them was, we know what you're doing and it's okay. That was all wow. they said, you know, but, but I was already at that point, I was enamored with orcas, you know, I, I fallen in love with them <laughs> and this orca, he somehow or another, I don't know how he's doing a show. He's entertaining 300 people. And he picked me out of that proud because of that connection that I feel for orcas. See what I mean? Yeah. There's no other way to explain why he would come to me. Cause not picking up an odor. I never touched him. See what I mean? Mm-hmm. And, and he knew that he knew that I had in my own heart, love for orca whales. And he was honoring that. And it was like this keeper said, he's never done that before. Well, like that could be. <laughs> what, <laughs> but anyway, what do, you, what do you see when you look into their eyes, you know, as far as oh, the man. level of consciousness that's looking back at you? Boy, it is so high. It's unbelievable. Um, and I can't help, I can't resist telling, sharing this story with you. It was maybe the ultimate experience with orcas. Uh, I was out in a boat with, uh, some of my students, uh, up on, on this wilderness Island in British Columbia and an orca pod came by. They were led by Nicola. Nicola got the name Nicola because of a Nick in her dorsal fin. And she was, you know, something fascinating, Daniel, about orcas is they're the only species we know of on earth. I mean, even insects where the females, those smaller than males, rule their societies. The Mm. only one known, okay? Okay. They're also the only great predator that does not kill their own kind. Bears kill bears, jaguars kill jaguars, tigers kill tigers, wolves kill wolves, and on and on and on, right? Right. Orcas don't kill one another. See, so they're, they're, they, they stand apart in many respects, meaning that they're, they're the ruler of their world as we are of ours, but they've, they've gone a step beyond what we have done so far. You know, they don't kill their own kind. That's yeah. a step beyond where we are. For yeah, sure. definitely is. You know, so anyway, I'm out there with the orcas and, and Nicola was going by when she's got a calf on her and the rest of her pods ahead of her. And I yelled, the guy stood up in the boat and I yelled, Nicola, 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 like that. And she turned around and swam right back to my boat, which means that she recognized me calling her name, apparently. And she had a little calf followed her to the boat, and then they left. I didn't think a lot about it. I was honored. I felt, you know, humbled by it. But uh, that night, we're making dinner around the fire, and all of a sudden, there are orcas everywhere. 30 orcas had formed a perfect semicircle around our camp. Wow. Uh, where we're, I mean, we're on shore, yeah. And Nicola was at the head of that semicircle. She was at the very apex of it. And uh, all the rest of them were cows and calves. None of the bulls showed up for this ceremony. The, uh, each calf was brought to shore by two cows. Uh, each, there was a cow on each side of the calf as it swam into shore. And then there, once they got there, the, the, the cows stayed floating on the surface, but the calf kept spy hopping, coming up out of the water, using its tail fluke to lift its head up above the water. You know, <laughs> I think you can picture what I'm saying. Yeah. And, uh, and, and it was it, what, what those cows were doing was meeting human beings. We were down to shore and it was look. they were looking at us in the face. They were listening to us, talk to them. They were listening to us hoot and holler. Uh, you know, they were meeting human beings for the first time in, in a social 
in a social ceremony that was orchestrated, orchestrated, that's a good pun, that was orchestrated <laughs> by, <laughs> by Nicola. You know, it was her intention. I have no doubt about it. You know, she thought to herself, you're going to call me by my name and honor us and we'll honor you. And they did, you know. And uh, we had a famous journalist on that particular expedition who was so enamored with what was going on, he didn't even take a picture of it, you know. Wow. <laughs> he didn't even have his camera. I mean, <laughs> but that's where we all were, see what I mean? Because we were engaged, you know what I mean? This was a, this was equals eating equals, like an ET race making friends with, you know, humans or right. whatever. That's what it was like. And uh, I mean, it was beautiful. It was wonderful. And it, it, and in a way, I'll, I'll never forget it. It changed my life. It changed many people's lives. And uh, all I can say is they're so aware that it knocks my socks off. <laughs> and uh, those people, those people that know them well, honor them, and uh, they they've even saved Native American lives. If you know, kids, teenagers drowning at sea who capsized their canoes, uh, Norco sw- pushed it to shore, and stuff like that. I mean, they're 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 just remarkable. They're so beautiful, so wonderful. Anyway, I love them. <laughs> for, for, for people who are listening who let's say some folks listening are going man i don't know about any of this you know like what's he talking right. about <laughs> how, how, can you address folks who who not the people who aren't really able to hear but people who want to hear but are afraid to believe and who are afraid to trust and who are afraid to experiment by reaching out to the world to see what reaches back like how, how, what do you say to those people well, that's a tough one, of course, and it's it's one when, once you care about these creatures and about their their future on Earth, uh, it becomes a very serious matter of trying to understand what to say and to whom, you know, and it's it's not an easy one to answer. Um, but one of the things that I do is, for example, I start building a bridge between their basic overview of life, of of ancient historical life on Earth, and um, and, and the role that dolphins have played. Once these people realize that dorcas are giant dolphins, it begins to shift their thinking a little bit. Okay, mm-hmm. they don't just see them as a great big awesome predator, uh, but as something that maybe could be friendly like a dolphin, which they often are. I, I remind them of something that maybe they've known, maybe they haven't. But in Greece, to kill a dolphin was punishable by capital punishment. Wow. If you killed a dolphin in Greece, you were dead, if people knew it. See? So then, you know, and we have respect for the Greeks, you know, in our in our classical educational system. And we give a lot of credit to things that we know and believe and so on to the Greeks and so on and so forth. So when you start reminding them that the people who know these creatures best hold them in very high esteem, uh, then you get to people start rethinking, well, maybe there is something to this, you know, and I think there is. I mean. There was, there was one book, it was all about uh, dolphins and how intelligent they truly are. And uh, in the midst of this book, he mentions a story from North Africa uh, where the native people recorded on the walls of their caves. Each year they would record everything that of significance that happened that year in their culture. And they would record it in, in permanently by carving it in the rock and then leaving it there and moving on to the next, you know, next year's report a year later. And they, they recorded, the, the, the archaeologists in the 30s, they report, took them back into their cave and they explained to them why these creatures that look like dolphins, you know, why they were on the walls of their caves. Well, it turns out the people said that these creatures showed up in a, in a bird that flew off of a giant bird. They said there was a giant bird in the sky and this small bird came out of the giant bird and came and landed on our, in our midst, in our village. And then there were beings inside that little little bird that came off the huge bird. There were beings inside that looked like dolphins, and they they dropped out into water, which came out of their their their. It's a little little spacecraft, what it is, and uh, they they were in the water underneath it. And once they got dropped into the water underneath the little spacecraft that came off the the main craft above, you know that's what that giant bird was. Um, then they began to communicate with these people telepathically. And these people recorded on their cave walls everything that the, they were told by the dolphins. The dolphins told them, for example, that there were four moons around Jupiter. You couldn't see Jupiter moons. Wow, no way. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Jupiter yeah, looks yeah. like a bright star in the sky, but you certainly right. can't see its moons. Exactly, exactly. And so when you come up against that kind of information, you start going, wow. You know, wow, how'd they know that? Who were these beings? What are they like? You know, according to these people... Um, the Dogon, that's what they're called, the Dogon tribe. Um, the, these, the, 
these these beings were there to basically educate them, and, and they did, and uh, and and they recorded all that enormously. And you go to yourself, wow! You start looking at different ancient cultures on the planet, as well as those contemporary cultures that live with these creatures. You find that they all hold them in high, very high hell, high esteem. Invariably, see what I mean? Not just a little bit, maybe not just a little bit here and there, but across the board. You know, it's a pattern around the planet. I mean, the the the, the reverence that people hold for dolphins. It, it was capital punishment in Greece to kill a dolphin. Well, let me tell you, you, you can't get by with that in many Pacific cultures to this day. If you even thought, if you even said a word that indicated you might go out and harm a dolphin, you'd be in trouble yourself. See what I mean? Uh, so. Yeah, maybe that's one way. I don't know, you know, because people have a soft spot in their hearts. It's almost like we instinctively recognize that dolphins are on a level of intelligence or awareness that we are, or higher, maybe. Um, and so sometimes that's the way I try to get at these at these questions, is trying to pick out the right animal model, you know, to begin to open a person's mind a little bit to the, what's possible. Yeah. And on a broader level, for somebody who's listening, who's saying, wow, I have a Western, you know, Cartesian car- compartmentalized scientific worldview, but I'm feeling called to go a little bit deeper in developing a relationship from my heart to the rest of the world. Right. Exactly. How, do you, how do you guide that person to finding those kind of experiences? Boy. First of all, I would say that... Um, they need to ask for them. That's what prayer means. To pray means to ask. And I think that's important. Uh, if a person's pre- at the point to where they're prepared to do something like that, if they're not, then you got to take a different angle. But if they are open and receptive to that possibility and haven't been ruined, spoiled by either the, the, the church of science or the other church of not science, you know, either way, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Of course. Yeah. Get, yeah. Yeah. So um, I don't know. That's what I would say. I would say that the best way to get people, the quickest way to get people truly connected to the planet Earth and everything that it's about would be to connect them with creatures like dolphins, you know, uh, who, who will blow your mind if you spend any time at all with them. I don't know. But, uh, it has been a real pleasure talking to you. What year were you born, <laughs> Dr. Eaton? 1943. Man, awesome. Just awesome to talk to you and uh, get this wisdom from you and really feel your heart in everything you're communicating. I just want to give the floor to you as we close out. If there's any kind of last things you want to say, you know, to to the folks listening to me, anything you want to close out with, uh, you know, to put a cap on all the things you've shared. Mm -hmm. I would say that we are so much more than we've been told. We are not mere another, quote, primate on the planet Earth who's stuck in a third dimensional motivational system. We're going to pass through all that and we're going to realize we're going to recover our original nature, which I think was, yeah, you see, it's hard to explain, but (laughs) Uh, we, I, I believe that we came to the earth, and I think in a way this is recorded in, in ancient books of wisdom, including the Bible, if you understand it properly. For example, in, in uh, the Old Testament, it talks about the Nephilim uh, in, 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 in Genesis, in the chapter on Genesis. It says the Nephilim. The Nephilim means those who to earth from heaven came. Mm-hmm. See? And... Uh, and what that really means is, of course, ETs. You know, there were beings that came from another world. The Watchers, they ahead, right? They were the Watchers yeah. bred with the human women, it says. That's right. And they mated with the daughters of men. That's what it says in Genesis. Mm-hmm. And they mated with the daughters of men. Okay. And that begins to open the story to what the, the incredible drama. You see, I believe that we chose to be here. I believe that humans chose to be part of this experience called the Earth. I think it was a great experiment, to tell you the truth. And... Um, and I think that, you know, we can begin to rethink uh, our origins because obviously, uh, to me, it's pretty obvious that we're off planet in our origin, that we didn't have some simple origin like we've heard in school. This is why I sort of almost become anti-intellectual uh, in a sense because these these lessons, these these dogmas are taught to everybody at every level of education now. And, and, and not, 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 they aren't necessarily true, you know. Did we evolve in the planet Earth? Well, what evidence do we have for that? I don't think we have any evidence for it. 
uh, we do have some indications that maybe we have off-planet origins because people write about it, you know, that, like that passage in, in Genesis, you know, uh, that made it with the daughters of men. And um, what all I'm saying is I believe we have an off-planet origin. I believe that we chose to be part of a great experiment. I believe that we've been blind for the most part during this time upon Earth in which we lived in human bodies. I also believe that uh, we're blessed by God and that love works and nothing else works as well. <laughs> and, uh, and and if you don't believe me, try, try a couple of death journeys like I've had. <laughs> and, but don't blame me if they don't work out quite right. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> anyway, I... I, I think that our, our view of our nature, our view of ourselves, our view of where we come from and where we're going, uh, it will all become very clear to us very soon, actually, not just many decades down the road or centuries, but I mean, very, 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 very near horizon events. I think that we're going to start to wake up to who and what we truly are. We're also going to wake up to the incredible degree of love that we're capable of, and we're going to begin to express that. To one another and to all that it is. How many, how many of us thank not only the sun every day when we see it? Mm-hmm. Why don't we? Isn't it a part of our life? Aren't we in our life dependent on it? You know, you know, the Native Americans say if you're getting mixed up and you're not thinking clearly, you better stare at the sun for a while. People say, oh, you can't do that. You'll go blind. Well, I've been staring at the sun for years. Let me tell you something. I'm not blind at all. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, Maybe the dark society, the the dark ones, the dark ones don't want us to look at the sun because maybe it helps wake us up. See what I mean? I think there's there's been a lot of tampering in our cultural uh, motif that uh, keeps us at a low level, drags us down. We ought to be elevating ourselves, you know. We're capable of tremendous things and of love. But the most important thing is, is the love in our hearts. Can you hold that love in your heart? And know that you are that love, no matter what happens to this body, no matter what happens to this earth, no matter what happens to this solar system, whatever happens there, what you truly are can never be taken away and will never be stolen or, or destroyed or smashed or ruined or, or anything else. That, that thing that you truly are, that essence of what and who you are is what matters most. Hold it dearly and be honor, honor it and be thankful. Oh, uh-huh. Wow. Dr. Eaton, thank you so much for your time today. It's been really great to talk to you. Thank you, Daniel. You're a real thinker and a real feeler. I know that. And I'm happy that you've got this show. And God bless you, brother, for doing what you're doing. Yeah, God bless you. Thanks for listening to the Wild Fed Podcast. You can help us grow the show by subscribing and leaving us a rating and review. It ensures better rankings and more advertiser interest, which translates directly into better shows, more awesome guests, and a constant stream of fresh new content. Have a question you'd like answered on the show or a hunting, fishing, or foraging trip you'd like to host us on? Email us at info at wild-fed.com. And be sure to visit our website, wild-fed.com, to check out the Wild Fed video show and store. Wild Fed. Food is all around you.